Good afternoon, Restoration Chapel and Traveling Stories, uh, family and friends. We are glad that you've joined us this afternoon, and today we are very excited. This is the first time that has been three people on this podcast, which is great. Um, we'll see how it goes, um, but we're excited about it. Um, today we have uh, Marie Proctor with us and Dolores Matthews with us. They're both pastors. Uh, Marie is at Lan- Lancaster or Lancaster? How do I say that? Lancaster. Lancaster. Okay, because see, I've heard people say Lancaster. I want to make Lancaster sure. Lancaster is about north, like Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Okay, Lancaster that's north. Is in the I south. Yeah. I got you. And Felt Dolores, the same. Yes, Thank and Dolores you. is at Blythewood. Um, both of those are right outside of Columbia, correct? Kind of. Yeah, I guess in opposite directions. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, um, but yeah, we'll talk more about the churches here in a minute. But um, we thank y'all so much for joining us. They're also. Um, have a podcast, uh, Pastors of a Dying Church podcast. We'll talk about that here in a little bit, too. Um, and we'll put a link also down at the bottom so you can join that and listen to that. Um, but we're excited to have them on. And as many of you know, and as you listen, we always start with testimonies. And we believe, as I say every week, as the scripture says, that we are overcomers by the, the word of our testimony and the blood of the Lamb. And um, we're excited about that this, this morning to kind of tell stories because we know that there's many people out there that have a story that are afraid to tell their story, or there's many people out there that think their story is not good enough or their story is too bad. So we want to just give you a route to be able to tell your story by being examples. So with that being said, I'm going to ask, um, Dolores, do you want to start us off? Do you know how life was before Jesus? How was life before Jesus? You know, that's a, a great question because, um, I've always felt like the Lord has been with me. Um, So life before traditional going to church, um, I don't know if that's a different way of maybe asking what you, yeah, I, we had to do this for brother Coulter one day, like write our testimony, if you will. And I titled mine. you remember that? Like, um, yeah, yellow yellow Thunderbird. Thunderbird. Um, (laughs) I I think, man, I, I was probably about five years old. I didn't grow up in church or anything, but just riding down um, the road in the back of my granddad's car. um, I think maybe I'd heard about Jesus a little bit from the um, Baptist organization. Uh, They were right down the road from our church. We would go there for BBS. And um, I remember a shoebox and some clay figures of Mary and Joseph and, you know, this baby in a manger. And um, Shortly after that, I remember riding down the road and um, I had a Hershey's candy bar. And I actually put a piece of it on the seat to, because I was convinced they, they told me Jesus was with me. And so I've just, I I may have not always known the ins and outs and what all that um, allowed me to participate in this earth with that knowledge, but I knew that creator was with me. And, um, and so, yeah, for me, it started at a young age, just awareness that I am not alone. So. Yes. And uh, now was your family um, church, did, did no. the church no okay so this yeah, was yeah. something i didn't like, grow up in church i grew yeah. up in bars okay so yeah, yeah. So, so, so this was something that god had to do on your on your like put in your heart yourself correct yeah yeah i got you i got you and um and marie what about you before you met christ okay so yes that whole conversion experience when you say okay this is it i'm going to follow your way lord not mine um i would have to say that my life is um kind of the same um saying that um you know there's still you know the messiness of life there's still uh just chaos there's still you know pain suffering there's still highs there's still lows and so when i think of that yes um it, it is a lot similar. The only difference now is that I, I don't depend on substance to numb all of that. I'm just able to go through that. And so I was raised in church um, just from a baby um, dedicated. And, you know, mom had, my parents had four children and um, my mom took us to church. Uh, my dad would get us ready in the morning, make sure our, our, our clothes were together, shoes and socks were on, ponytails were done. You know, he got us all together and sent us off to church with my mom. Um, but yeah, and 
so I did grow up, you know, in church knowing that, but life now, you know, I, I guess it has, you said yours was yellow Thunderbird. Mine was like, I could just see the Lord, uh, moving in decades of my life. Like the first 10 years were like innocent years that like, I knew there was evil, but I don't think I was, you know, knew no evil, I guess. And then the next 10 years were a product of, um, acting out, you know, the, the hurt that had been done. And then the next one was like, okay, now what God, you know, let's, let's try things your way. So yeah, I, I'm like, I, I felt like the Lord has been with me this whole time. Like there was never a place that I felt that he was not with me. So I don't know how, when people say, I don't feel like the Lord is with me, what that feels like, because yeah, I, I feel like deep down inside, I just knew that, that he was with me. Yes, and we know in those times, even though we know that God's with us, there's, as you said, there's valleys and mm -hmm. there's mountaintops. And um, I think a lot of times as Christians or as people that come to Jesus, that knows Jesus, we a lot of times we think that those valleys take us out of the presence or the love of God, um, especially new Christians, new people that have just found Jesus. I've noticed like, you know, for the first couple of weeks, hey, man, it's great. It's awesome. And then life starts hitting, um, temptation starts coming back up, jobs start coming back up, coronavirus, murder hornets, all these things. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Never Thank happened you for the them. reminder. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. This hurricane that no one can pronounce. Yeah. Yes. Well, yes. 2020. Yes, yes, definitely. Definitely. And I seen the other day where we're going to have a full moon on Halloween for the first time in like Shut up, really? Yeah, I'm like, 2020 is just going to be awesome, right? <laughs> well, I thought about that, Bobby. Are we going to be allowed to trick-or-treat? Like, really? Yes. Like, in the pandemic, can you? So, are they going to put, you know... You're already wearing a mask, so... Yes. I see, yeah. yes. <laughs> um, dress up will be a lot easier this time, right? <laughs> <laughs> Draw yeah. a picture on your mask, and there yeah, you go. Just put on your mask, and go ask for candy. <laughs> but, <laughs> Don't be scared. Yeah, we go through these valleys in life, and we go through these hard times in life, and a lot of times we either think God is punishing us for things that we have done, or we think that God is not with us anymore because our, our faith has not mm. grown to a point where, you know, that's like, you know, my son Elijah, if I'm not in the same room with him sometimes, he starts freaking out because he thinks dad has walked out of the house or walked out here or there, um, but now that he's getting older, he, he, he's learning that, hey, just because I'm not in the same room with him, I'm still in that area. Um, can you help us help our listeners and our people that are watching this? In those valleys, what can we do to help remind us that God is still with us and still going through the valleys with us in our lives? Um, I, I think we can just pause. Yeah. Um, sometimes we try to do too much. And I, I think what has helped me is to remember to just be, um, to be still. Uh, there's a prayer that um, James Finley does. At the, uh, he has the podcast, um, Turning to the Mystics. And so there's a, a prayer that he does in there. And it's, it begins with a, be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am. Be still and know. Be still. Be. And so with that, and then you, you, you pause and you, um, you go into a time of contemplative prayer, meditation. Um, that, you know, that sounds pretty foreign given to what we're used to traditionally because a lot of times we're geared more toward doing than being. And I think that if we can find a quiet place to settle ourselves, um, that's this season of life that I'm in. So probably 20 years ago, I probably would have had a different answer. Uh, but 20 years ago, nobody told me to just be still. And I think it's in those still moments that I personally am able to feel the Lord's presence. Uh, I, I don't know if we're, if we're wanting those experiences to be those big emotional experiences that we are having at an altar service in a Pentecostal church. We may be shocked to realize that we're, we, we may not necessarily always have those big explosive moments, yeah. but even in the smallness of the moments, if we can just settle ourselves, when I go out in the mornings and I sit before the Lord in silence and the, the, the you know, I can, I can feel the wind, I can hear the birds, all of creation, you know, tells of his glory, man, God is with me, you know, he's with me. So I, 
uh, I don't, what you got? <laughs> you know, I was, I was I thinking, you said, five minutes. You, you were like earlier, I, I don't know how this is going to go. It's three of us. And I'm thinking, you have no idea. We have the same soul. So I can absolutely piggyback on what she's saying and say that we can encourage our, ourselves and, and seek, you know, go inwardly to say, okay, I just need to be still, still, um, because it's perspective. What is my perspective about my outlook in life? And so like, uh, Marie said, uh, you know, getting into this, these, um, situations where things could be, you know, hectic or whatever as a believer and what are we supposed to do with that? I think it's also important to, um, evaluate, well, how have I responded before? And so I think sometimes if we can look at this, maybe the cycles or rhythms and routines that we've fallen into, we may realize that we probably tend to um, do more damage to ourselves. We're probably more like a, a drama triangle, if you will. Um, so now how am I going to, you know, that whole sitting, taking time out to be with the Lord. I don't think that we can just say, okay, now today I'm going to be still. Um, if you haven't created a lifestyle of being still, mm -hmm. a, a pattern of your life to say, I'm not going to no longer fret or worry or be concerned. What? And so to be able to participate in what Maria is saying, I think, first has to start with just saying, okay, what is my perspective of what is happening? Because throughout, throughout scripture, when people did not wait on God, um, what began to happen was the perspective of who God was or what God was going to do changed for them. Like their, so their circumstances, you know, weren't changing. Everything looked crazy. So what do we see? Like even Abram and Sarai, what do they do? They go and bring on another lady to have the baby, even though God had said they were going to have a baby. Um, and so I think we panic when our circumstances don't change instead of just saying, I need to change my perspective right. in this moment. And no, God, you haven't forgotten me. I am not alone. And then mm -hmm. Sam said, I'm, I'm just going to be still and just, you know, so that's what I do. Yeah. And, and too, with this, like I, um, with the pandemic, when it first hit, I had ordered groceries. I did not know that everything was beginning to shut down. Um, people were panic buying. I, I, well, I ordered my groceries um, online at Walmart. And so I had wrote up and I thought, what is this madness out here? People <laughs> coming out with buggies full of water and toilet paper and all kinds of things. And, and I would just see them go by and, and I'm like, oh, did you go shopping for me? And, you know, I'm just cracking jokes outside of the Walmart grocery order. And all these people are coming out with like loads of stuff. And I'm like, what is going on? And I could just feel myself. I sat at the back of my car just reading a book while everybody is blowing the horn, hoping that they're going to bring their grocery order. I told the lady, I said, listen, my order is not that important. Um, it's probably about $150 worth of stuff. But if, if you need me to come back tomorrow or another day, it's not a big deal. Oh, no, we're trying to get everybody out of here. I probably waited for three hours only because I wanted to be kind to them and them not have to put my stuff back. And it was just like nobody, like when panic sets in, people feel the, the Desperate. uh, desperation to do, 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 <laughs> instead of just be. And so when I was sitting there taking inventory, I'm just sitting back, you know, chilling, reading my book, like watching all this, you know, wanting to ask people if they need help putting 20 cases of water in their car, you know, because it's just like blowing my mind. Like, okay, the fear has set in, like, where do we just breathe? Where do we stop? Where do we see God working in all of this? And we have been, you know, I tell you, I can only speak for myself, but for us, the pandemic is one of the best things that has happened to us in a long mm -hmm. time. I know for other people, other people have horror stories, but if you just pause to see where God was working, I believe everybody's been holding their breath, doing so much. And now they're so tired because now they're just having to keep holding on. That's so right. where's the being? That's right. And, you know, and I think about when you're saying that, you know, Jesus teaches that too. When the disciples come and says, well, everybody's hungry. Um, you know, everybody, you know, and he tells them not to worry. You know, he's like, feed them, you know, and give me what we got so we can feed them. But then another time he even tells them, look at the birds. Don't I take care of the birds? Look at the flowers. Look at the plants. Look at the trees. Don't I take care of all these things? And um, I, I love it because I, I tell young people that all the time. They're like, oh, so he's like hippie. And I'm like, no, he's not a hippie. He's just telling you if he will take care of those things, then he will take care of us because we're much more important. Those things were spoke out of existence. We were blown breath into existence and molded into existence. So wouldn't he take care of the things that he molded into existence instead of just the ones he spoke into existence? And, you know, during this time, like you said, I, I've told my wife many a times, um, 
how many people before this pandemic complained they never had enough time to be with their kids. They never had enough time uh, to, to get into the word of God. They never had enough time to do this, this, or that. And now um, we had to make time to do, I mean, cause now we don't have, you know, most of our jobs were taken away. Most of our, a lot of stuff were taken away. And now we take, we can't, we have to realize those things that we take for granted that we shouldn't take for granted anymore. And that comes from being still and realizing that God is still in control of those moments in our lives. Um, with that being said, uh, when do y'all remember, um, and we'll start with Marie on this, getting started serving, serving in a church, serving in a, uh, in, in not just outside of the church, but inside the church, because I believe when we have that call upon God, we begin doing things outside the church. Don't get me wrong. We begin telling people about God. But what about when you were uh, processing over to start serving into the church? Do you remember when that was? Oh, yeah, I was way little. Like, because I grew up in church, you just help. You know, it's like my little one, Callie, she's three. Man, she wants to help. She came and cracked an egg for me this morning. She wanted to crack all six of them, but, you know, that wasn't, one was good enough for me. And so I can just remember from a kid, we just always pitched in. You know, mom was Sunday school superintendent, and so we always had to be there early if whatever she needed us to do, we just pitched in. Even singing one time, I sang a special with my friend Kara. And, uh, you know, I, I don't know how well it went, but, you know, I felt I felt great about it because there was no audio recording and you didn't play back what you sounded like. And so you just knew that you had this big courage to do that. And I think I've only sang in church once since then. And, um, and that wasn't recorded either. And that was... <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. That was with my friend. And... Um, yeah, so that, thank the Lord. Hallelujah. Um, but we, we've graduated from singing specials. Yes. And um, we just sing out loud in church yes. and in the car. In car karaoke. So, yeah, I think just as long as I've just been alive, my whole family is geared toward, you know, serving. And, and we were all in the church. And that's really where I knew. I think the question for me would be in the community because we were so church oriented. Like, you got people to come into the building. We don't live in a day where you know, now it is, how do we get our people outside the building? People yeah. are so comfortable inside the building. Where do we serve outside? So that would probably be a more challenging question for me at an older age. But yeah, as far as in the church, it would have been way young, way, way young. Yes. Dolores, do you remember? Mine was early on too. Um, well, we ended up at the Church God of Prophecy because of relationship um, with another couple. And so they served. And so quite naturally, we just, um, we did whatever they were doing. And so they really did um, drag us along. So whether it was because we wanted to be with them or we had a servant's heart, hmm, I don't know, but it was, it was fairly quick soon after we got there. And, and I'm glad you brought up, and uh, Marie, I'm glad you brought up about community because I was going to bring that up because I know um, we've had conversations before at, you know, uh, state events and things like that. Community is a big deal. I know at our ministry at Restoration Chapel, and I know both of your ministries where you're at, it's a big deal to find people that are lost um, and not just lost, some people who think they're found, um, to find both of them. Because, uh, you know, there's always that kid that plays hide and go seek that's trying to hide, but he's in the middle of the road. And you're like, you're right there. Um, there's a lot of Christians out there that or a lot of people out there that call themselves Christians and they think they're, but they're still lost. Um, so, you know, we, we've talked about community and doing community events, doing not just events, but going out into the community, trying to reach the importance of community. Like I said, is a big part of my heart and I know it's a big part on yours. Um, can you tell us where that came from, that importance of community? What did you ask? You. Oh, me? I'm so yeah, sorry. One. I one. That. Yeah. Oh, I'm like, how did I miss that? Um, I, I think, uh, when, when, think. <laughs> when Marie said something about Callie wanting to do eggs last night, Aiden wanted to help me, and they're the same age. He wanted to help me put clothes in the washer, and I missed the moment because I was like, no, I, I haven't. You need to get back in bed. So I was more concerned about making him follow the rule than I was having him serve and teach him. So, yeah, I just had a little conviction about that. I'm like, dang. I miss that. Um, I'm glad I could help you thank out. You. Thank, you. thank you, Bobby, too, for this moment. But, yeah, I realize that. And so that that's speaking volumes to me. Like, um, as we just train in, I, I know that we say they are little people in age. But as new people come to understand how creator, 
creator has created us to serve and love one another and, you know, take care of this wonderful earth that God has given us. And um, it's, it, I think it's always been in me as well, just to serve. That's, that's my personality is helper. And so that has always come natural to me. And um, I think I've always had this desire to um, help other people and, and I guess if we were looking for a defining moment where I, I really um, not surrendered my behaviors to the Lord per se, but just my will to do whatever God would have me to do, he um, strategically placed me in places where I could use the messiness of my pain for ministry, if you will. And I'm doing those quotes. but um, And so I, I think it's that willingness coupled with God's grace and God's provision and, and positioning me where it came natural. Yes. Um, and so, yeah, it, it, I, I don't even know that I can take it back, Bobby, to be honest, because, and, and so that was outside the walls and, and the community for me, um, people are people. Yes. And, um, there are days that I would probably qualify as the loss, to be honest. And, um, and I think I've, I've said, that I'm just looking for somebody to find me. Yeah. You know, I'm going to be real about what's happening inside of me on some of those days. And so um, there's nothing secular or, or sacred. There's no in between. It's like we are all here um, in God's economy. And so I guess that's how we're able to be so out of the building um, and be comfortable with that, that everything God is doing doesn't have to happen in the building. And so it naturally, I don't want to say it overflows to the streets, uh, we feel like it's been in the streets and in the church. So, did you think, yeah. yeah. So, okay. So I'm like thinking, you know, I'm, I'm listening to her and I'm just trying to think like, where was I more community um, minded, I guess. Um, and it would have to be probably the fundraisers that we would have at church, you know, as a kid, we would go to the streets to go door by door to sell donuts. And, you know, that's when everything was safe. You didn't have to worry about people putting stuff in your food or whatever. And so, you know, we'd go door to door and I realized that every neighbor had a story yes. and some would want you to go away really quickly. And I thought, what's that about? And then there's <laughs> other people that wanted you to stay. And I thought they've got to be lonely. And so I realized that these people that we were, um, you know, petitioning this, these fundraisers for um, probably had um, more of an impact because, you know, it, and it, we would invite them to church too, but it wasn't just about the church. So when you think about that, I, I had to fish for a little bit to think about, okay, where would that have been whenever I had that contact with community and contact with community because we didn't go to to places or go to people's houses that were outside the church. I mean, in fact, the first time I ever went to a spend the night was, you know, a kid in elementary school uh, when I was a little older in elementary school because it was always church folks that we were affiliated with. And um, so, yeah, it would have had to been that desire to know people's stories would have had to been through those fundraisers of door to doors, knocking on doors. Cause I'm, I'm a people person. I can just sit back and watch people and wonder what their story is. Um, rather than trying to, to judge them, like wonder what their story is. Wonder what, you know, doesn't mean that I don't have judgments. I do, you know, I judge myself and you know, I can judge others too. We all have judgments, but, um, I do. I think, I think that that must've been the first initial, contact that I had with community outside of the church. Yeah. And I don't think I would have ever put language to that had you not caused us to dig a little deeper. Like, where did this come from? Yes. And, you know, I, I think about me just growing up, um, for some reason, my mom was the type that would, she just loved everybody for some reason. Now she would, she would act like it was a hard time, but she would love everybody. And um, I'll never forget her just telling me, you know, if somebody needs a ride, pick them up, take them to school, do this, do that. And I think that's where, in my heart, where God began to deal with me. And it didn't matter, like I said, color. It didn't matter, you know, any any of that stuff, poor, rich, it didn't matter. It was just like, hey, if somebody needs a ride, take them to the school. If somebody needs a burger and you have an extra dollar, you know, maybe you only get a four chicken nuggets, but hey, you do that, right? <laughs> And, but because I think she always put it in my heart that, Hey, you know, there's people out there that are in need and people don't want to tell you their needs because they feel ashamed of them a lot of times. 
But if you will just watch, as you said, watch and listen, listen to stories, watch what's going on. Um, my wife can't stand it when we, well, she, in a good way, but she <laughs> says when we go out to eat, she'll be talking to me and she's like, who are you watching? And I'm like, I'm not being nosy. I'm just noticing what's going on over here, you know. <laughs> not being um, nosy. You know, not trying to be nosy. It's just, you know, those opportunities that we miss a lot of times because we're busy as we go back to what we talked about before of, of being still. Um, you know, we think our schedule has to be, you know, I think about, was it uh, Mary and Martha when Jesus came? One's doing all the work and the other one's just sitting at the feet of Jesus. And, mm -hmm. and a lot of times we're so busy in ministering, we don't see what's actually going on. And um, and I agree with that with community, you know, loving loving the community that we've been put in, um, especially the communities that we've been put in, um, because we get into a time and age where people don't love their communities anymore. Mm. Um, oh, yeah. They just live in them. You know, they don't, some of them don't even live in them anymore. Um, but they just, they're there. And, uh, and it's getting to a point where people are falling through the cracks because as Christians, we don't open up our eyes and see that there are needs where, around where we're at. Um, with that being said, I know both of you uh, have a lot of mentors in your life besides you two together. And we're going to bring that, your friendship together, how much um, y'all help each other out. But I know there's mentors that you've had in your life. And um, as, as a person coming up in ministry or a person that just got saved, how important is it to have those people to lean on with each other? Marie, if you want to start us off. Yeah, I'll, I'll start. Um, I, it's very important. I think whenever I first, um, you know, decided that my life needed a, a different path, I, um, I had just um, got drunk the night before. And uh, the next day I went to church and I thought, okay, I've got to change my life. Well, that night I knew my life had to change. And so went to church and asked, the pastor if there was a place in camp for me and I had been coming back to church but I just wasn't all the way there yet you know and, and after that night before I just thought I've I've got to do something different you know I had already had Macy she's she was you know almost 18 months at that point and um so he was like yeah I'm gonna make a phone call right now and you know and man I was signed up now I wouldn't advocate that for camp now <laughs> but that's where you know she and I met um Ruth and I met, I call her Ruth, she calls me Sam, um, but that's where I, I met her, and there was just something about that friendship that, and I think the distance was great too, because somehow, we never said being accountable to each other, but there was something in her that I loved that, you know, definitely got in her, but that just kept on drawing me back to, I want to be a better person, um, and so with that, that relationship, there was also people along the way uh, like for one, um, are you asking us to name these people or just yeah, how important yeah, it is? If you feel that's fine. That's perfect. Yeah, definitely. Oh, oh yeah. I mean, I can just, I can think about there's, there's a lot of people, you know, that have really helped pave that way. Um, my grandmother, my Nana, she can, she can remember and she'll still tell me to this day. I know when you walk down to the altar and you grab my hand and said, Nana, will you go with me? Um, you know, now she would say that's the moment that everything changed for me. That was not a moment everything changed for me. That was a moment where I knew things were beginning to change. I just wasn't all there yet. I just kept feeling like this overwhelming. There was so much crap I had to <laughs> let go of, you know, before I could say, okay, I think, I think, you know, I think this is it. Cause it was, it was traumatic. You know, the whole coming to Jesus thing for me was, you know, when I think about it, it was probably pretty traumatic. You know, there was so much of, me that I had to let go and I still have to every day is still a could be somewhat of a traumatic moment of <laughs> trying to let go of me but um I remember and then you know just even you know Pastor Atkins at the time there was uh he had so much confidence in me and I was um you know I was one of the first women lay leaders there you know at the church I didn't know I didn't know that was a thing to be impressed about but one of the other ladies you know had mentioned that to me and you know, just there's different things within, you know, at Harvest that, um, you know, different people had, I don't want to say investments in me, but I do want to say that um, uh, different people really poured into me. Now, if they poured into others, I don't know, but I just know that I was one like kept thinking, God, where's all this coming from? 
And so, um, yeah, I can't just name one person. Like there's so many different people that, that would call and check, not just check up, but they made it, you know, a priority to be involved in my life. My, my godmother and my god sisters, um, they would show up prior to that at my job and I thought they loved Sonic. They didn't like really like Sonic. They just liked it because I worked there and they got to see me. And so that was a point of contact that they would show up, not trying to spiritualize or Christianize anything. They just showed up with their presence. And it was just a reminder of the grace of God. And I think that different people showed up at different places in my life as a reminder of, you know, the grace of God, having a child young, unmarried, um, that'll grow you up too. Some people, uh, some people can just skip on through life and, and it not even affect them. But for me, it was something that I thought, okay, now I'm not just responsible for me. I'm responsible for a little person. Dude, that's like, that's scary. You know, <laughs> that's <laughs> real scary. Absolutely. So, I mean, but it's, it's huge. Like the people that the Lord just puts in your life to, to glean from, I don't care if it's people, physical people, or if it's um, books you know, writers, authors that put their publish their stuff. And it's something that leaps off the page and seeps deep within your soul. It's like, okay, I, I might not be friends with this person, but <laughs> I feel like what they say communicates my language. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, Lawrence, would you like to add any more to that? Yeah. Um, I think that we've had those relationships through the years, you know, mentor, mentee. Uh, the reason why it's hard to like, not necessarily hard to name. It just would be so many to name because we didn't put those labels on it. That's right. So if you're asking this oh, question yeah. for a young person, it's all about relationship. So yeah. what you're saying is, who is, no, I'm not telling you what your words were, but yeah. what I hear you saying to me is exactly what has gotten us to this place. It is, it is getting, getting into relationship with, with people that you allow to speak into your life, like Marie said, um, people who can check your blind side, people that you trust that, um, you're going to be open and vulnerable with. And um, I, I can't say enough people that, that will help you and guide you and tell you things, even if you don't want to hear it. And for me, besides this, you know, what Marie and I have going on is soul companioning. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's soulmate. Yeah. Um, but when I think about the mentor mentee, we're actually not too far apart as far as age wise would be Chucky. Mm -hmm. I love him. Yeah. And he could tell me things way back in the day. Um, and there was a season in my life where I needed someone to mentor me. We wouldn't have called it that. That's right. For me, he was a good friend. And he was, he was one that I would have said, he'll tell me like it is. You know? Um, and there have been many times that, you know, our season in my life where something was tough or whatever, and we would just be having a casual conversation. So it wasn't even like it was um, – formal and well Dolores tell me what's on your mind today I mean the relationship was so um connected that because we were already living life he had the freedom to tell me you know even really hard things and so um it didn't matter if I didn't agree with him because the next day we were going to talk again or working in ministry so yeah I think the reason why is because we didn't make it very formal we didn't say okay now sign this contract and come into a disagreement yeah. And, I, and I think that's the beauty of what we got to experience back in the day. Now today it almost gets to be too contractual in a paper context. And, and so there are some things that I don't know that if I was starting out all, all over again, that I almost would feel slighted because it feels so formal in a sense, but we got the luxury and it could be just how we're living with technology and, and just church just looks so different than it did, you know, 20 years ago for us. But isn't that fair? It was just, we just love life. We just love yeah. people. We loved each other. We had relationships, but yeah, we had those. We didn't know that's what it was. That's right. You know? That's right. And, um, and with that being said, I know uh, Marie, you mentioned about, uh, you know, being one of the first lay women in the church or however at Rock Hill. Um, and y'all are pastors and, um, to me and to, I guess this next generation, uh, having a woman pastor was not that big of a deal, but I do know there's in the past, there's been issues. Um, again, I grew up at Williamston. Well, that's where I'm at now, Williamston. And we had a um, sister Cobb was the pastor there for over 20 years. 
Um, and back when they couldn't vote and back when they couldn't do those things, you know, but now uh, things have changed a little bit. Um, we're still um, moving forward, I hope. I, I, I hope we're still moving forward. Uh, but with that being said, uh, being if, if there's a young lady that watches this and says, hey, you know, I feel a call into the ministry. Um, as as y'all know, our youth pastor at Restoration Chapel, uh, Courtney James, um, she, she's talking about becoming a lay, you know, a, a lay minister herself. Um, but different things like that. If you if you were speaking to a young woman that was fixing to do this uh, and say, hey, you know, I feel a calling to be a pastor or a evangelist or even just a, a lay minister, what kind of advice would you give them to start off with, Dolores? If you'd like to start. I was going to say, I'll oh. tell her to do it. <laughs> yeah, I was Jump thinking, in. Definitely, definitely. Courtney, Courtney, if you're watching this, you know, good for you. Yeah. Um, I would have thought she was already one. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah, definitely. yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but, but I think for us, it was actually, it was weird because in ministry, different parts of the state respond differently. Yes. And so Marie grew up where women were greatly supported. And I was in a space where I was challenged on everything in every corner. And, um, and then when we actually stepped into like senior roles, you know, I'm probably really incredibly received. And so I don't, but I think I'm, I'm grateful that I had to go through that season of people challenging me because it made me certain of my call. Yeah. But that was, yeah, it was, remember that? Mm -hmm. It was kind of like in and out. And so if there is a female that's struggling, you're normal, you're healthy to say, should I be doing this? Shouldn't I be doing this? Cause it really caused me to dig and just seek it out and seek the war for myself. Like I knew that the call was there. I knew that's what God was calling me to do. Um, and then when I stepped out, of course you get all this backlash and, um, but yeah, I'm more convinced and, and even more prepared to, um, declare to someone why I believe biblically it's okay for women to, to pastor minister and, and have all those, whatever you say, right. Um, so that's, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, I, I can recall, I can recall going to, um, well, a neighbor of the church, um, wasn't really affiliated, but friends of the church, um, invited me to, uh, preach her daddy's graveside funeral. He died probably within two weeks of being, um, diagnosed with like bone cancer or whatever. He'd been involved in church with in years, but over the last few years he had not been. And so she was over everything. She didn't know who to reach out to. She reached out to me. Um, ask if I would do a simple graveside service. I said, yeah, absolutely, not a problem. At that graveside service was a lot of Southern Baptist men, and I was doing the gravesite. And so I had no clue. Like, I didn't I didn't know that, you know, people, I mean, I did know that people mm -hmm. had problems with women, but I didn't realize, like, Lancaster was a heavily area where women, you know, were, I don't want to say looked down upon, but it was almost like, okay, this can't be right. Like you're in the wrong, wrong spot. So I did the grave site and went to the car and um, a couple came, um, it was a younger couple and they came and they were like, Hey, you know, I just want to, to tell you, you did a, a really great job. You know, like he would be, he, he would be really honored with, with the words that you had to say. And he said, look, just curious. He said, you know, a lot of the people standing around the grave site, he said, you know, that's not, you know, women, preachers and ministers aren't accepted in the Southern Baptist, um, you know, uh, conference, you know, area or whatever. He said, so I was just wondering, he says, what do you say when people say that? And I, and I just stopped for a minute and it kind of had like a moment of, what did you just say? <laughs> like, what just happened? Like, I'm so glad I didn't even know. And I just turned around and I said, I guess I would just tell him that I'm called by God, not man. Take yeah. it up with the Lord. And so that's my thing is, you know, when the Lord tells you to do something, it's not always going to be accepted logically by some folks, but it is going to be, you know, that place where you just say, okay, God, this is between me and you. And if someone has a problem, they're going to have to take that up with you. It's not my battle to fight. It's not mine to just figure out or validate myself. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not trying to use my words to convince you um, or to convince myself. It's almost like a, okay, I'm sorry you feel that way, but <laughs> well, yeah, well, and, and I think did I stop you? No, no. Okay, and I think dude, because I, I think this is important to say for a listener, especially a female listener, um, just do it yeah. and do it with grace and do it. Um, you know, serve the office with integrity and, and respect and honor God and honor people. And when the diamond that's inside of us recognizes the diamond in someone else, that 
overflow or, or those beams of light that come out of that exchange, I think people will know that this is authentic and real and you don't have to run around chasing your tail. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't mean that people will still wrongfully accuse you or give you their opinion about why this is inappropriate. Um, and cause there was a lady in our church, they uh, came to start coming to our church and she, after, I mean, she let me know a lot. Yeah. You know, I, I never agreed with women preachers. And every time she'd say it, I'd, I'd say, now, now, Fran, you know, I got feelings. I can hear you. you know? <laughs> and she'd say, but the Lord, you changed my mind. Mm -hmm. like, there's something about you. I can't deny it. I cannot deny it. And Bobby, I was just being true to, to my call. Well, you know, to my God and, and to, to the people that he has called us to share this incredible, amazing life with. And so that's what I would say. Yeah. We've had numerous people and numerous men that have said, mm -hmm. you have changed my view on women's pastors. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I too mm -hmm. feel like just do it. We need your voice. Mm -hmm. Like the, the people need to hear from a female perspective, even with uh, brother him right now, co-pastoring it. It's wonderful because, you know, they have a woman, you know, that is now, it's not just the pastor's wife trying to, be there for people. I can't imagine the taxing, you know, weight that pastors' wives have to go through. I, I've never been in that seat. You know, we've never been in that mm -hmm. seat. We don't know. I mean, that's got to be, you know, a hard seat because, you know, Robert and Kenny doesn't sit in those seats. Yeah, they're pastors' spouses, but they don't sit in, I mean, they have jobs. This, yeah. this is not their job. This is the church they attend. And so, um, that's true. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the they're, they're better they off than, they're better off than the females. The, yeah. Than the female spouses, the, yes. The female spouses in the role of pastor, because not to say that, you know. One's better than the other. Right, yeah. right, right. But just looking from our perspective, they probably have a lot less stress than Sherry does with you. Yeah. You know yeah. what I mean? And, I, and maybe I'm assuming we don't need to assume, but just from looking back, we've, we've said that often, like, oh, gosh, our, our men are so fortunate. You know, that doesn't mean that we can minister without them. Right. And there are a lot of the um, – um, there's a lot of ministry that Robert carries that I don't have to, and I'm grateful for that. But we have seen where a lot of women carry a, a heavy load of the ministry that just come natural to us because we're female, so we're going to do it anyway. That's right. Um, yeah, right. And, um, and so, uh, yeah, I, I feel like that we're at an advantage as far as overall family. Too. We're at, a, at an advantage. Yeah, yeah, I'd rather be a female in ministry than a man. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. No, Honestly. seriously, seriously, Honestly. it puts that whole burden on both spouses. Yeah, like there is nobody to fall back on because everybody, you know, and maybe y'all are set up different, but we've seen a lot of marriages where the females have to be like the children's director and yeah. Yeah. you know that worship kind of stuff. Leader, yeah, right? worship leader and just participate. And like she said, our spouses get to attend. Now Robert's hands on just because he's pretty hands on, yeah. but. If we, if he has to skip church for a month, we're going to survive. Yeah. You know, and brother Atkins told us too, when, when that call into ministry was more so than just, you know, working with children, he had Kenny and I come into the office and he, you know, we talked about it and he said, Kenny, this means that you're going to have to carry the diaper bag. Yes. And so as long as we're raising little people, you know, Kenny, Kenny can be hands on in certain areas, but as long as we have little people sitting in the benches, then that's his job. And he, he carries the diaper bag. He carries the kids to church. I get to church. He brings the kids. They may look a mess. You know, he's been, you know, <laughs> or he's happy in this pandemic that he hasn't had to come to church. I'm just being honest because it is a circus, you know, bringing, bringing all the kids to church oh, yeah. and be responsible for them. I can't imagine from a man's perspective, what's that like, you know, mom is just fall in and do it and, and whatever but we found, we have found our balance. And so this really has been like mm -hmm. a sabbatical for him to be able to breathe a little bit, not, you know, have to get all the kids up breakfast fed, you know, clothes on, hair done, you know, teeth, you know, yeah. That was a really good question, Bobby. Thank yeah. you for letting us oh, no share problem. from a female perspective and how we see things and, and how our family dynamics is. Yes. And I tell you, it's, it's, you know, it's good to know. And like you said, I, I see where you're, you know, where the female, especially, I know my wife, I know what she goes through because she works a full-time job, um, breaking barriers in a full-time job, which is, I, 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 I am very proud of her about that because she's moved up in the corporate ladder where a lot of women have been held back because of being a woman, mm -hmm. but also, you know, helping with worship teams, helping pray for people, mm -hmm. helping with women's ministry, helping, and, and, and then just being there for me when I have my many breakdowns, 
which any pastor should know by now, you have this. I told you, you feel know, lost. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, those little times where you just want to be like, oh my gosh, you know. Man. I but, quit <laughs> every Monday. Yeah, every they Monday. No, I see you, you're right there. You're in the road. <laughs> Yeah, every, every Sunday about 12.30. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but, yeah. but no, it's just like, you know, and, and I think, and, and again, with the two different personalities, too, of a male and a female also, a, a male takes a, a male can take it and kind of keep moving on. A lot of times a female takes it, holds it on. She's told me this before. She holds mm-hmm. it on, and, and it's, you know, and, and due to the emotions and things and different, you know, as, as a male and a female. But I – I love it, you know, because as you said on your half, as if you feel a call into the ministry, don't be stopped because of your gender. gender. Don't be stopped because, and and I'll say even go farther, don't be stopped because you're a different color or a different uh, cultural of of somebody else that you think, because as we know, um, most of our churches, you have white churches, you have black churches, you have Spanish churches, you, you know, all this different churches don't let that stop just let the calling of god go through you as you said and when you do that people will start seeing that or even your age i, I know we, we run into an issue with people being we say they're too young to minister mm-hmm. or too old to we're too should. old to minister yes mm-hmm. but if you allow that calling to go through you and it not be about you but be about god then people will start to realize hey you know as you said as the lady came up and said you know you've changed your mind about that mm-hmm. you can you can have those moments in your life um and with that being said, uh, the podcast, so the podcast of a dying church, uh, uh, pastors of a dying church, sorry, podcast of pastors, pastors of a dying church, um, that started this year, right? Or last, late last year? It was May, May. 2019. 2019. Okay. Yeah. So May 2019. Um, what was the thought process? Hey, let's just do this or, hey, um, let's try something new. Let's think outside the box. Can y'all kind of go into how did that got, how that got started? Well, I guess at that time it had been 19 years of friendship and conversations on front porches and, you know, our kids have been, you know, grown up around all of our conversations. You know, we can have some pretty far out conversations and be okay with it. And um, I think the biggest push was Dylan, Mm -hmm. uh, Dolores' oldest son, saying, y'all need to record these conversations. And we're like, "Ah, yeah, okay, you know, and then he was like, no, seriously, like, this would be great. And so we thought about it. and. that he was just the big push, like setting, setting everything up. And, um, and then it was like, okay, now what would be the name of it? And, you know, I, I didn't have a thought. I was empty. I had nothing. And, uh, Ruth came up with pastors of a dying church. It's funny. I'll let her unpack that. But somebody said, I wouldn't want to go to your church if your church is dying. (laughs) I'm like, they haven't listened to the podcast. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) So, So yeah, sure sign. Somebody hasn't listened. Yes. Um, and it, and it really was birthed out of a season that we were walking through Y Church. Oh, yeah. Just being honest. Yes. Because what we, were, what we were being affected by, and not within our own church, like the Blythewood or Lancaster, but other church people, um, we just started looking around. It's like, man, if they're going to heaven, but yet they all but just cuss me out just now. And they're just so rude and mean and ugly. And that really grieved us. That super grieved us. So those were some of the private conversations that we would have. It's like, what the heck is happening with the church? Like, then we wonder why. And so there was a season that we grieved the church the, culture. The, the, yep. Church culture. Well said, mm-hmm. friend. And, and we, I mean, when I tell you, Bobby, it was painful. It was painful. And we were just looking at every, and it was just, we, we were just grieving it. And so we would, um, like Marie said too, uh, you know, there's so many people that have influenced us, whether it's just reading books, other people, we, we, just, we were, we started getting other perspectives because I mean, we were in a, we were in a struggle. We were, we were in a season of just bailing out like, and I, and I'm, I'm saying that knowing that I'm opening myself up for people to assume all kinds of things. We'll assume it. It was <laughs> tough. It was really tough. We're not dying. <laughs> and so, uh, but we did realize that if the church didn't make some changes, that's going to die. And um and not the church that Jesus died for, but us. We we the were just made church. Yeah, it, it just we we couldn't do it anymore. We could not do it anymore. And so the conversations we were having, Dylan would he was privileged enough, either privileged or punished, um, that he he could hear them and he could hear a lot of things that we were saying privately. So, you know, our our kids do know us, and they were just like, man, that's 
this generation wants to know that because they're sick of church. Yeah. And um, at least what the church look like, or the church culture that is just killing people. And um, and that's for us. It, there was no freedom in that. And so that's that's just kind of where we're at. We we asked the tough questions to each other, other people, and you know it's been kind of. Um, so we're we're still trying to see where that's all going to eventually unfold or stop or whatever. We're just having a good time now with it as um, as as life goes on. But it's with the intent. So what problem are we trying to solve? We're just trying to bring awareness that not all churches look like the church that hurt ABC. Mm-hmm. Right. And not all pastors are what because they clump us all in. They say, "Yeah, but if you really knew me," and uh, so we just wanted to give a platform to say it doesn't have to be like that. Yeah, and yeah. I love that because you know, and I think we talked about this. I think we were at a training together, and I mentioned this to y'all about how many times we just look at the trees instead of look at the fruit, and mm-hmm. um, and a lot of times we look at all the trees and they look like they're all dead, but there might be a tree out there in the middle of the the deadness that is producing good fruit. And, and a lot of people are missing those fruit because of they're seeing the deadness on the outside. Mm-hmm. And, and I believe that we've got to get back to the point to show people if through podcasts, if through, um, cause those people are not coming to our churches. So we better go outside of the churches and, and start doing different things outside the box to reach those people and, and show them that that fruit is good. You know, that, that, that fruit from God is good. Not everybody there's a lot of church hurt going on, but there's also a lot of people that love, that want to see you do better, that want to see you grow, that want to see your life be changed with an encounter with God. Um, and, and so, and and then we we kind of concluded on this at the local church where we all pa- where we pastor. Um, I said we pastor because she's with me in the life blood every week too. <laughs> but um, out of that came this mission then what church, and, and I use this term loosely because I don't have a, a, a great word for this. So what church would we want to attend? Yes. And then we strive, you know, to glorify God and make sure the message that is coming from the pulpit is, is not like tickling the ear. So it's not like that, but a place of love and acceptance. And I love what Mark used to say, way before you believe, behave, we you're going to belong and so and and all of that just but it started out of a painful season of man the church is jacked up yeah Yeah. you know well we always end on this last question and um and i'll give it to both of you if you just preached a message or you just went out into the community and testified or gave them your testimony and told them you know about jesus and they decided to give their heart to jesus what would be the first thing you would tell somebody after they given their heart to jesus what is the next step for them? What is the next um, thing that you believe that will help them grow in their walk with God? So, um, Marie, will you start us off with that? Mm-hmm. I have nothing. <laughs> <laughs> I am a pastor of how many years? And I, have I have nothing. Oh, let me sit with that for a second, Bobby. I know we got a couple more seconds. Yeah, let me. Can, can I, I go? Yeah, yeah, go, I ahead, go ahead. I, do. I would be like, you want to come over for dinner? Yes. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. She's hey, really quick on this. Hey, you want to come over for dinner? Like, yeah. what are you doing Tuesday? You want to go to lunch? Mm-hmm. For me, it's relationship. Yeah. It's relationship. Because not because I can impart some wisdom to them, but I want to learn from them, too. I think that the exchange goes both ways. Yeah. You know? I go with what she said. That's it. You know, and I was, I was talking to, um, I think it was Abram, and he was telling me that, uh, you know, because um, you don't know what they're going back into either. So that relationship, to have that relationship with them, because when they go home, not everybody might be saved. <laughs> or when they go to work, not everybody might be saved. So to have that relationship with them mm-hmm. as they, you know, now that they've given their life to God, to let them know that there's somebody there for them and not against them and, mm-hmm. and to be there with them, definitely. Yeah, Marie, well, yeah. I like, yeah, I like what, what she said because that is definitely true of us. You know, we say, because I'm just thinking, okay, what would I tell them next? You know, but <laughs> I think it would be, you know, let's follow up. Let's, you know, let's grab a cup of coffee. But we let's, wouldn't make it so formal. We'd just be like, no, hey, you want to go to lunch? Yes, yes. Sure. It yeah. would be like a, because I'm thinking, what plan would I tell them? I wouldn't. That's why I'm empty. I'm mm-hmm. empty because I don't have a plan. I don't know yeah. what to tell them because yeah. everybody's, you know, journey is going to look a little different. And so let's just, let's just be, you know, let's, let's just share life. be together. Yeah. So That's definitely. Right. With Big yes, Mac. Definitely. 
Well, I want to thank you all so much for jumping on this. And I think we're actually going to do this as a dual podcast. Um, I think you are going to pull it out on Pastors of Dying Church, too. And yes, we are. We're going to put it out on Traveling Stories. But we want to thank you so much for joining us. As I said, uh, Dolores is the uh, pastor at Blythewood. Um, do you have an address for that, Dolores? 1909 Lork Road. I'm so proud of you, Dolores, because most pastors, I ask them what their address of their church are, and they're like, we have a website. <laughs> oh, wow. Well, we have that too, but yeah. yeah. 1909 Lork Road. Yeah, but yes, definitely. But if you're in that area, please stop by and see Dolores and Marie. You're at Lancaster. I said it right this time. Yes, we are 1677 Alpha Road in Lancaster. Yes, definitely. And uh, again, uh, we'll have to jump back on this because I'd love to talk about how, you know, um, over the last couple of years, I know Marie, you've started co-pastoring with a pastor, coming to bringing two churches together. And um, also just some different things. I know about camping ministry and different things like that. I'd love to get to talk to you all about those. Um, and when we get some more time and maybe do another one of these, do a part two of uh, traveling stories. But uh, I want to thank y'all so much for joining well, thank us. Thank you, Bobby. Yeah. No problem. And is there anything that you'd like to tell our listeners? Last words for our listeners. Your wife, I love her. Yes, I will. Please. <laughs> well, thank yeah. you so much for joining us. Um, you can listen to this podcast on Spotify, on Anchor, on uh, Google Podcasts. Um, Apple Podcasts on all these other podcasts um, or you can watch this on Facebook Live or on Facebook we leave it on there after you show it or on YouTube and we thank you so much for joining us we love each and every one of you we want you to go out and tell your story now that you've heard our stories go out and tell your stories and have your own traveling story God bless you we love you and we will see you soon